In the early days of video games, everything was made from scratch. They required countless hours of programming to implement features that could not always be reused game to game. They were essentially one-offs. The pioneers of game programming like John Carmack and Michael Abrash of id Software, the studio responsible for the classic and technologically outstanding games Quake and Wolfenstein, were inventing things along the way. The earliest iterations in these series didn't even use real 3D. They instead used a ray casting algorithm to draw 3D scenes. By the mid-90s, truly 3D engines which could read and display 3D objects instead of 2D sprites were becoming more prevalent. Engines like X-Engine and the Jedi Engine, and id Software's first truly 3D engine, the Quake Engine, were forebearers to many of the technologies we use today. In 1998, with the release of Unreal Tournament, Unreal Engine had already begun building a reputation of creating high-quality, reusable code that rivaled the other licensable engines of that era. While Unreal Engine wasn't the first to license out their engine to other studios, the quality of the engine and their enthusiasm within the community set Tim Sweeney and his small band of programmers apart. Now, decades later, Unreal Engine is still just as exciting as it was from day one. But this still begs the question, what exactly is a game engine? Let me start by saying that rendering images to a screen is not as trivial as some people think in an age where user interfaces and graphical styling is everywhere. A game engine has to do it 60 to 144 times a second while accepting user input, simulating physics and interactions, driving animations, handling dialogue and music, accepting all the different asset and file types, capturing cinematic lighting with realistic cameras, placing and animating foliage, serving multiplayer content and doing matchmaking, rendering massive terrains, driving AI, adding particle effects, programmatically defining physically based materials and shaders, editing and arranging worlds, not to mention all the low level stuff it needs to do like communicating with the GPU, batching and submitting draw calls, handling complex OS requirements, plus the deluge of drivers and APIs. If that all sounds complex to you, that's because it is, but it's also a lot of fun. A fairly detailed diagram of everything in a game engine might look something like this. It should be pretty obvious at this point why early game programmers didn't want to have to do all of this stuff over and over again, which is why game engines put reusability at the center of everything. Nowadays, game engines aren't just for games anymore because of how reusable they really are. Movies, motion capture, architecture, and design in general all use real-time game engines to their advantage. It's safe to say that good game engines like Unreal Engine are a lot of things to a lot of people. A simple definition of a game engine might be, a game engine is a highly reusable, functional, and efficient toolset capable of rendering images in real time and responding to interactions from a user. If that's all you came to learn about, then thanks for watching. Otherwise, stick around, and I'm going to tell you a lot more. In order to show you what a game engine really is, I'm going to walk you through seven different high-level components. For each one, I'm going to give you a tour of a real implementation of that component in a real game engine, Unreal Engine. Each section will only present a small portion of the information available on the topic. It will be a whirlwind tour, so to speak. By the end of this video, I hope you feel motivated to go out and check out Unreal Engine yourself. The seven high-level topics that I want to tell you about are hardware, OS, and drivers, core libraries, assets and resources, rendering and visual effects, animation, audio, and last but not least, gameplay. Let's jump right in. Game engines have to talk to your computer and tell them how to display your game, play audio, and accept input. An important part of a game engine's interaction with your computer is its ability to tell your computer's GPU, a processor whose job is roughly to render images, what to render on the screen. In order to do that, many layers of complicated and intricate software is required. In Unreal and other game engines, instructions are sent through something called an RHI, or rendering hardware interface. This abstract level of software allows your engine to submit commands and have the hardware and underlying drivers decide how to turn those commands into images. 
Unreal supports different types of rendering hardware interfaces depending on the platform. On Windows, for instance, it's DirectX 11, DirectX 12, and Vulkan. Game engines also need a way of running the same code on different devices. You may want your experience to run on a Windows computer, or on a VR AR headset, or on an Xbox. Many game engines manage the details of packaging or creating a game for a specific platform. You can see those details easily in Unreal Engine's platform settings. Here you see all sorts of tunable parameters that creators can use to bring their games to their audiences. While there are lots of other things that game engines do to talk to the computer or operating system, one last thing I feel like highlighting is input. In Unreal, you can define two different types of input. Input that is instantaneous, like a mouse click or a reload button. These things are called action mappings in Unreal. Axis mappings are actions that occur in a range of possible positions. For instance, pressing two keys simultaneously to strafe in a game. Unreal has ways of talking to all sorts of different devices, like keyboards, mice, and controllers. Core libraries represent the functionality that is essential for a game engine to run. This consists of libraries or software that is used constantly both in creating the game engine and by the user who's going to use the game engine to create a game, movie, or visualization. Unreal Engine is a huge piece of software with decades of development time. As a result, the engine source code is millions of lines of code. That makes defining what core is pretty difficult. However, if you go to GitHub, where Epic, the creators of Unreal Engine, have the source code for anyone to view, you can sign up on their website. You can see that there is some functionality that they have marked as core. Now, one of the most important core libraries for any game engine is a math library. And if you go down here, you'll see we have exactly that. Now, math libraries tend to be pretty large because they're used everywhere within a game engine. As you can see, this particular file is over 3,500 lines of code. Another important library is a physics library. Many game engines use third-party physics libraries. This means in essence that they borrow the code for the engine. Physics libraries are responsible for simulating real-world physics on objects in your virtual scene. The thing about game engines, though, is that every part of physics is tunable. For instance, gravity is totally optional. This gives you a lot of control over how things appear and interact in your scenes. Sometimes we might not even want physics for certain things. Physics systems are large, complicated libraries full of lots of mathematical detail and interesting and unique solutions. For that reason, there is lots and lots to talk about. If you want to learn more, I would suggest checking out PhysX on NVIDIA's site. They're the owners and creators of PhysX, and it's also the same library that Unreal uses. And you can check out their materials, check out some of the papers they've published, or just come into Unreal and play around a bit and see what you can achieve. An important part of a game engine is a system that allows users to add content to the games or experiences, such as images, videos, characters, animations, anything. Modern game engines know how to read files of myriad type. That said, because performance is so crucial to game engines, these file types are usually converted to a different type of asset before the game is played. So for instance, you can see here I have a file and under source you'll see this is an HDR, .hdr file. But if I go into this file, you'll see it's not an HDR, .hdr file there, it's a .u asset file. Converting objects to a uniform type like U asset ensures that when you're working on the game, everything functions the same, no matter what type of file it is. And also so that the game engine knows how to load all these different types of assets when you press play on your game. Now, 
game engines manage tons of resources in a large project, so game engines also usually have a way of managing all those different assets. In Unreal, that's the content browser. The content browser gives you a lot of control over how you organize your different types of assets. In addition, Unreal Engine's world editor viewport is the place where all the action happens in terms of bringing these objects into your scenes and arranging them as you like. The world editor, which happens in this viewport, lets you take assets and simply drag them into your scene, move them around as you see fit, and then press play. One of the most complicated and most important parts of a game engine is the rendering pipeline. A rendering pipeline, in essence, is a series of steps that the game engine uses to display images of your game. While you've seen already that a game engine is a lot more than a rendering engine, it's important to note that without a fast rendering pipeline, a game engine just wouldn't be very useful in practice. Rendering can briefly be summarized as lighting, shading, environmental effects, and post-processing. In Unreal Engine, lighting can either be rendered in real time or beforehand. There are a variety of different virtual lights which game engines provide. The most common are point lights, directional lights, and spotlights. Using information about the lights in a scene, game engines tell your computer how to turn 3D models from vertices and points in space to visible and recognizable objects. This process is known as shading. Unreal Engine has a very powerful way for you to define exactly how objects in your world are shaded. The material editor contains countless functions and abilities to create materials that look like, for instance, water, rock, or metal. In addition to telling the computer how objects should look, a game engine defines ways for your overall environment to have additional look and feel. These effects such as fog, color correction, vignetting, bloom, and many others affect the look and feel of your game. In addition, particles can be used to create common visual effects like sparks and explosions and all sorts of different things. While a number of different industries utilize animation within Unreal, games rely on engines to bring characters to life. To achieve complex character movement, which seamlessly transitions between a number of actions is a lot of work. Game engines provide a number of tools to accomplish this and Unreal is no exception. While discussing the details here is beyond the scope of this discussion, I'll describe a few core ideas in Unreal Engine. An asset which can be animated has a few components. It has a mesh, which is the visible characteristics, the vertices and polygons of your mesh. Complex animations beyond a very simple mesh require a skeleton or blend target. So skeletons are just like their name suggests, a system of bones, um, which each part of the mesh follows. So if I go in here, you can see my hierarchy has all the different bones, how they're parented to each other. For instance, this bone will follow this bone, will follow this bone, and you can have very complex hierarchies like this. These bones help animators move pieces of the skeleton, so you can control the position of different parts of your mesh. Most of these bones are authored in a different package and imported into Unreal. Blend targets, which are mostly used for facial animation, are snapshots of how your character looks, or how, in this case, the nose of this character looks. And you can simply blend between them. This is very good for very small details that you need to achieve. Animations are transitioned in Unreal in a number of ways. They can be triggered by gameplay events, which we'll talk about a little later, but they can also be incorporated into what are called finite state machines. These machines define the different states that a character can be in, in this case just idle or walking, and it defines the rules for transitioning between those states from going from idle to walking. There are a number of ways to blend between different animations or in between animations and physics. 
In this example, you see this character is actually reacting to the stairs. Audio is hugely important to the immersion of a game or experience. It gives the user cues as to where to look or the intensity of the scene. Audio systems involve hugely complex networks of code, which take audio and can do things like project it into 3D space. This allows a character to detect cues from different parts of your scene. Now, in addition to that, audio can be mixed and you can even control the way the volume of the sound falls off based on the distance to the character. In general, audio libraries need to be able to measure occlusion from a sound source or, for example, need to be able to increase the reverb when you enter a larger space. This is HQ. Signet found the vehicle's transponder, sending coordinates now. Newer versions of the engine are going to include even more features, such as convolutional reverb, even procedural audio. Last but not least is gameplay. Gameplay broadly is anything which is the effect of experiencing the game. More specifically, it's a set of rules which define how your world can be interacted with. So, of course, Unreal has an incredibly robust gameplay system which can be programmed in a number of ways. Blueprints, which is Unreal's visual scripting language, is a visual and plug-and-play way for designers and technical artists to define gameplay behavior. It has most of the gameplay features included, so you can do a lot with Blueprints. Scripting languages like Blueprints generally need a way to run underlying code. Something special about Blueprints is Unreal Engine's reflection system, which allows underlying code to also call blueprints. This blueprint, for example, does a lot of different things for our experience. It accepts input, it will do math based on parameters and variables. It also does things like specify how components of our objects are placed together and how they move with each other. Blueprints truly lets you do an amazing amount of work in Unreal without touching a single line of code. Wow, that was a lot. Well, I hope you now see how hugely complex and diverse the functionality of a game engine really is. Unreal has built so many features that we've hardly covered all of them. If you want to learn more about features, check out the documentation and of course, download Unreal Engine from the Epic Game Store. If you want to learn more about game engines in general, I would highly recommend Jason Gregory's book, Game Engine Architecture. Much of the inspiration for this video came from there. And last but not least, if you want an immersive and detailed learning experience in one place, check out re.school. And look for new Unreal Engine courses that will be arriving all the time.